Forest Hill Church is driven by its mission of building bridges that connect everyone to dynamic life in Christ. We love this city and envision a future where God brings about a dramatic transformation from within it. One that moves people across its divisions to become united. A city that is impacted by the gospel in a way that can't be ignored. And at the core of this movement are people like you. That we live in a way that invites relationship both to God and each other. That we face the hurts of this city head on with love and action. Not focusing on what makes us different, but on a God who created us uniquely. That people from every generation can make a connection that is a step towards the kingdom. And that is how a big, audacious transformation can happen, with each of us building a bridge in our community and clearing the way for our neighbors to meet Jesus. Good morning, Forest Hill Church, across all of our campuses, as well as those of you who are gathered online. Thank you for being here. You will be glad that you came. Please know that for the last many months, I have been eager and excited of, of making the introduction of my friend, Dr. Brian Loritz, to speak to the Forest Hill family. Uh, he and I had the privilege of being able to serve in a local church here in our city several years ago, and I can vouch for you that he is a man of God, and he's a very good friend. Brian Loritz right now is currently serving as the Executive Pastor of Teaching and Development at the Summit Church in Raleigh-Durham, as well as overseeing the church's initiative to plant churches. He is also the president and founder of the Kainos Movement, which is a movement dedicated to seeing the expansion of multi-ethnic churches all across the country. In addition to being a, an accomplished author, award-winning author, he is also a very gifted communicator who knows how to be able to interpret the word of God, the gospel of Christ, in a way that's engaging and that encourages people to pursue the Christ who is after them. He has dedicated his life leveraging his gifts and abilities and his network of relationships to see the church become everything that God designed it to be as the church was intended to be, this vibrant faith community, but also the catalyst for transformational change in our culture, in our country, and all over the world. He goes by many titles, but among his most favorite titles, including the first and foremost as a follower of Christ, is his title of being a husband to Corey, his wife of 24 years, and a father to his sons, Quentin, Miles, and Jaden, it's an honor. Would you please give a warm Force Hill welcome to Brian Loritz? Well, thank you for that introduction, Jonathan. Uh, that was fantastic. Need to take you on the road with me. And uh, we'll first stop, we'll, we'll go to my home and get you to convince my wife to call me doctor. She does not call me doctor. Anyways, what an honor and joy it is to be with you all. Uh, today, I have heard so many wonderful things about this church throughout the years. Early 2000s, uh, our family lived uh, in the Charlotte uh, area. Actually, we were in uh, Ballantyne when it was nothing but horse fields. Things done change since then. Uh, but uh, And to finally be here at this church um, with people like, uh, like Pastor Jonathan Scott is a great joy and delight. I'm grateful for all the leadership team, but I got to tell you, in all my years of preaching in various places and meeting uh, a lot of people, I don't say this to flatter him, you'll be hard-pressed to find a finer human being uh, than Pastor Jonathan Scott. And so I give God praise for him. Yes. The only thing I don't like about him is his choice of shirts. So... Uh, <laughs> So we'll ask the Holy Spirit to, uh, to help him with that. Now, I'm going to do something here. I want to do something here that's going to uh, throw your production team into convulsions. Um, I, I'm going to preach a different sermon than what I preached uh, the first service. Uh, already they're giving me the stank eye. Um, they don't know this, but we're going to call this How to Get Through a Crisis Part 2. And however you want to do that, as far as putting stuff on the, uh, the podcast or whatever, we can talk about that. But I just feel led of the Spirit of God. Uh, we were in Psalm 13 in the first service, and this service, if you can meet me in James chapter 5, James chapter 5, pick me up in verse 7. I just feel compelled to still talk about this issue of crisis, uh, but to do it in a much more granular, um, application-driven way. Pick me up in verse 7 of James chapter 5. I'm reading out of the ESV. If you don't see it on the screen... That's because the production people are angry with me right now, all right? Verse 7, James chapter 5, I'm reading out of the ESV. James writes, 
Be patient. I didn't think I'd hear any amens on that. Therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth being, here's that word again, patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. I think he's trying to make a point. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. I love it. Underline these words. Verse 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door as an example of suffering, and here it is again, patience. Brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord. Make note of that phrase. That's how we'll end. How the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for this church, all of its campuses, all of its reach, all of its leaders, all of its people, Lord God. Thank you for how you're using this church in phenomenal ways to reach a culture for the glory and fame of your name. God, as my grandmother says, we don't live in heaven and board down here. We live out our Christianity in a very real context. And oftentimes that context is fraught with problems and pressures and challenges, Lord God, that come right to our front door. God, we want to be an example to the world that our hope, Lord God, is not in this life, that our joy is not tethered to our circumstances, no matter how adverse at times they may be. So, Lord God, would, would you outfit us what, with what we need today to navigate the various situations and storms of life in a way, Lord God, that proclaims your goodness to the world. Give me great grace, Lord God. Stand in my body, think with my mind, speak with my tongue, those things you'd have us know, say, and hear. Make it clear, plain, practical. Again, as my grandmother would say, put shoe leather on your word that we we might know how to walk in it. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. One of the worst things that could ever happen to an oyster is to have lodged within its shells a little teeny tiny grain of sand. Now normally when this happens, 99.9 times out of 100, this this oyster is more than capable of locating the grain of of sand and removing it or expelling it from its premises and going about the day's affairs. But there are those very rare moments where try as this oyster may, it cannot get rid of this grain of sand. It's in a situation, a circumstance, it cannot get out of. It's at this moment where this oyster is um, irritated, frustrated, exacerbated, and any other kind of unsanctified aided. Or to quote a, a 90s urban poet, it's at this moment that this oyster feels as if it's about to lose its mind up in here, up in here. Oh, that worked at Forest Hill. I didn't. So here's this oyster, it's in this situation, this circumstance, it cannot get out of, it's at the end of itself, it's about to lose its mind. And it's at this moment where this oyster decides, if if I cannot get out of this situation, let me make the most of it. And so it finds this grain of sand and it begins to coat it over and over and over and over again with a liquid substance that when this substance solidifies and hardens, it turns into something that grandmama would pay top dollar for, a pearl. Did you know all a pearl is is the fruit of a very frustrated oyster? Whenever you see someone wearing pearls, I want you to have this thought. They are literally wearing someone's bad day. There was no irritation. If there was no frustration. If there was no sense of, 
I want to punch somebody in the face. There would be no pearl. God has sent me all the way from Raleigh, North Carolina. To encourage you today that he has a vision for your life. He wants to make you a pearl of great price. A trophy of his grace. For we, Paul would tell the Ephesians, are his workmanship. Greek word, poema, from which we get the English word, poem. We are God's work of art. That we are created on purpose and for a purpose. Your, your mom and daddy may not have planned on you being here. And one of the ways you know that parenthetically is if your closest sibling is a decade older than you, you was a surprise. But in the sovereignty of God, there are no surprises. Created on purpose and for a purpose. To be a trophy of his grace. A pearl of great price. Boy, if I was in a chocolate church, cue the Hammond B3 organ. That's some shouting stuff right there. Yes, Lord, make me a pearl, make me a pearl, make me a pearl. But here's the un-American portion of the sermon is, our problem is we want the destination. We just don't want anything to do with the process. We... We want to get to where we're going quick, fast, and in a hurry. But if you could take a tour of God's kitchen, you would be shocked to discover that in God's kitchen, there are no microwaves. Only crockpots. So what does God do? God, God, God looks at Brian and he goes, Brian, um, you're here. And, um, and I, have a, I, I have a vision for your life. You're here. I, I, want, you to, I want you to go from here to here. I, I want to get you to a place, here it is, of fall-off-the-bone succulent faith. And, and the worst thing I could do to you, Brian, is, is to give you a, a blessing, a platform, a, 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 a stage that you don't have the character infrastructure to support. So from your journey here to here, I have to put you in my divine crock pot. I, I have to put you in situations and circumstances you don't like. I'm going to have to put the lid on you so you don't get out of it. I'm going to have to slowly turn up the heat, and you're going to be upset and angry with me. And Brian, you're, you're going to have to learn to lift up your eyes from whence cometh your help, knowing your help doesn't come from the letters behind your name or your social network or your bank account. You're going to have to look to me, oh, and by the way, as you're doing your tour of duty in my crock pot, you're going to have to learn to be patient, Brian, because the only thing worse than waiting on God is wishing that you had. We come now to the book of James. James is originally written in a language called Greek. It's in a section of the New Testament that's called the Epistles. Hang in there with me. It's going to get a little bit technical, but I promise you I'm coming to your neighborhood. When we come to the book of James, if you were to ask the question, what makes James's epistle or letter different than all the other epistles or letters? Here's what Greek scholars, because again, that's the original language of James. Here's what they would say. James, if you look at it in the original language of Greek, has the highest concentration of what we would call in Greek construction imperatives. Now, all an imperative is, is a command. James speaks in command. His whole letter, it's one command after another command after another command. In fact, he kicks the whole thing off with a command when he says, count it all joy. Now we come to our text, James chapter 5, verse 7, and right out the gate, James begins with a command. It's as if he's grabbing us by the collar and he's saying to us one word in the Greek, two words in English, be patient. He's not recommending He's not suggesting. 
He's not giving us tweetable advice to consider. He's saying, be patient, be patient, be patient. Two words in English, one word in the Greek. Uh, Greek word is as technical as it gets. It's, it's, it's a compound word, makrothumos, makrothumos, makrothumos. Macro means long. And thumos, it's from thumos, we get the English word thermometer, this instrument we use to measure heat. Thumos means anger. So literally, makrothumos means to be long towards anger. It was D.A. Carson, that great New Testament scholar who taught for years at Trinity Evangelical Divinity Seminary. He says in his wonderful book, Scandalous, he says, you know why we Christians never, ever, ever, forever, ever pray for patience? It's because we Christians are theologically astute enough to realize that the very request for patience means at the same time we're praying that, God, you put us in something we do not like. You don't learn patience in cushion seat air control environments. You don't learn patience when the money is flowing in, when the career is going well. You don't learn patience when you get a clean bill of health from the annual physical. You don't learn patience in one of those rare seasons when the kids are being compliant. Prosperity is a horrible teacher. You only learn patience when you wake up one morning and you feel a lump on your breast and you go to the doctor and they do the biopsy and they run the tests and you're told it's breast cancer and there's chemo and radiation and maybe surgery and waiting and waiting. You only learn patience when you thought it was just an annual physical man and the doctor calls you and says, well, your PSA levels are high and come back in and there they go running another biopsy and they run the tests and just like that your world is flipped, turned upside down as you're told it's prostate cancer. Parents, you only learn patience. No, you weren't a perfect parent. You made your share of mistakes, but you did your best. You tried to raise those kids in the fear and admonition of the Lord and yet here is one of them playing the role of the prodigal out in the far country and you've screamed and yelled and cussed and fussed and you're having to learn to parent from your knees. You can't control it. Parents, you only learn patience when you've got that child with mental health challenges. And maybe they're always threatening to kill themselves and what do you do? You only learn patience when you thought you had that stable job and you go in and one day there's the pink slip and just like that your job is gone and now you're in a situation where there's too much month at the end of the money. You only learn patience when, um, once again, ladies, you have to put on that hideous bridesmaid dress. Stand at the altar. And I know your thought, she ain't even as cute as me. I want to be careful with that. The end zone, single people isn't marriage. Yeah, there's a lot of single people who wish they were married, but I'll give you some insider talk. Keep this between us. There's a lot of married folk who wish they were single. <laughs> Macrothumos. How do we get through a crisis? Macro. Thumos. All right, Brian, I, I, I guess I'm kind of understanding what you're saying. You're just, but, but I feel like you need to drop it down a couple thousand feet. You're up in the clouds, 35,000 feet. I thank you for this definition. I think of patience, very ethereal. Can you bring it down to ground zero? What exactly, what exactly does patience look like? Are, are you telling me that when I find myself in life's crock pot and when I'm in this situation I can't get out of the kind of just sit there, fold my arms, and kind of passive resignation? Is that God-glorifying patience? No. If you want a picture, a 
of what James is meaning when he says, be patient. Just go back to verse 7. He gives us the picture. He says, middle of verse 7, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. If you want a picture, James says, of the kind of patience that glorifies God, look to the farmer. Now, we understand this. No farmer goes to his barren field before harvest, looks down at his barren field, then up at God, then back at his field, then up at God and says, God, in the name of Jesus, I command corn. Waiting on you, God, corn. I'm being patient, corn. We know that's not how it works. What does the farmer do? He goes to his field and he plows and plows and plows and sows and sows and sows and cultivates and cultivates and cultivates day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out. It is backbreaking work, and yet he does it all under this basic principle that unless the Lord sends the rain, my labor is in vain. Watch it now, so that the farmer shows us that patience is never passive resignation. It is always active participation. It is me doing my something, waiting on God to do his something, knowing that when God adds his something to my something, now we have something. Of course, the biggest biblical illustration of this kind of active participation is Paul. Did you know that there is a genre of Paul's letters, his epistles, called the prison epistles. Much of his ministry takes place within a crock pot, a situation he cannot get out of. And yet, if you read these letters that Paul wrote from, from prison, we see him doing several things. First of all, he gets to prison and he says, hey, do you have a pen and a piece of paper? Uh, here I am in my crock pot. I, th th there's a group of, of, of people in churches I want to write and encourage. So I inside this crock pot, he's writing and encouraging and writing and encouraging. But there's something else you see when you read these letters. In each of these letters, he says his version of, I want you to know since I've been here in prison, I am praying not just for me, but I'm praying for you. So that here he is in the middle of these adverse circumstances, right? and encouraging, and he's praying. But not only that, to the Philippians is, I want you to know that since I've been here, the gospel has been proclaimed throughout the whole imperial guard. Unbelievable. Here's Paul. He's in this situation he can't get out of. He realizes, I've got these two guys chained to me on either side. We're stuck together, so let me share the gospel with you. And with you, they rotate off. Two more come on and share the gospel with them. They rotate off. Two more come on, share the gospel with them. He goes, I've run out of people to share Christ with while in my crock pot. Now, let me say something to you you won't like. Praise God, we're in a therapeutic culture. I go to therapy. I go to therapy. I believe in therapy. But you have to be careful in this therapeutic culture <laughs> that you find yourself going through something and now everything becomes about you. At some point, mature Christian living says, how can I transform my hospital room, how can I transform this awful situation I'm in, this unemployment season, whatever it may be, into a megaphone to announce the goodness of God? I'm a Delta guy. I've got way too many miles with Delta. Pastored in Memphis for some years. The problem with Memphis is that Memphis wasn't a Delta hub. Atlanta is a hub. So whenever I had to go somewhere, I had to always go through Atlanta. In fact, it's been said that on the way to hell, there will be a layover in Atlanta. <laughs> I remember one time I had to preach up in Chicago. 
which is north of Memphis, but because I'm going on Delta, I had to go down south to Atlanta first, change planes, get on another plane, go up to Chicago. So we get down to Atlanta. There's a problem with our plane, mechanical difficulty. They fix it. We're a little bit late leaving, and I'm looking at my clock going, man, I got to speak at this event. Um, We're landing in O'Hare. There's going to be traffic, and uh, we got to hurry up and get there. And my goodness, we get to Chicago's airspace, and God bless our pilot, but she decided once we got to Chicago's airspace to give us an unsolicited tour, an aerial tour of the city of Chicago. We kept going around and around and around, and I'm going, won't this lady please land this plane? Doesn't she understand? I got a place to get to. I got a message to deliver around and around and around. We go, well, if you've flown it all, you know what's happening. We're, we're in what they call in aviation terms, uh, we're in a holding pattern. And all a holding pattern means there are, there are a group of air traffic controllers who sit up high, look down low, They have access to information we don't have. The pilots are communicating with them, and we're in this kind of holding pattern, not to annoy me, not to get on my nerves. In fact, we're in this holding pattern to actually help me because if they would have landed on my schedule, it would have done irreparable damage and harm. Ever felt like you've been in a holding pattern? It's going around and around. Maybe some of you all, you're in an infertility journey. Around and around. Maybe with that child. Around and around. Maybe in this season of unemployment, you're thinking, if one more person tells me I'm overqualified, around and around. We serve a God who sits up high and looks down low who sees what we can't see, who knows what we don't know. And as my grandmother used to say, he may not come when you want him, but he's always on time. I love it. James says, while you're in your holding pattern, verse (laughs) 9, he says, do not grumble. So James is showing us that patience isn't just physical, it's profoundly attitudinal. Now, now, now in order to really understand the weight of James' words, you have to understand who he's writing to. James is writing to ethnic Jews who have recently come to faith in Christ. And I promise you, when these recently converted ethnic Jews read this word, do not grumble, they they had to have thought of their ancestors who had been liberated from Egypt, were on their way for what should have been a six-week journey to the promised land, and what happens in the wilderness Murmur, 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 grumble, grumble, grumble. So what does God say? Hey, Israel, this was supposed to be a six-week journey. But because you're murmuring and grumbling, I'm just going to add 39 years and 46 weeks. I wonder how many of us God is saying, Hey, Brian, we should have been on to the next page. Shoot the next chapter. Shoot the next book. But your attitude is so foul. See, I hope you're getting the picture here. Grumbling is a big deal to God. Why? It's the same reason why grumbling is a big deal to parents. When our kids grumble, the basic message that's being sent through their grumbling is, I know better than you. Grumbling unleashes a vicious assault on the sovereignty of God. Plus, grumbling just ain't cute. I remember when I was single, I went out with a girl one time. She grumbled the whole time, and nothing in me said, ooh, can we do this again? (laughs) I'll say it. I think one of the problems with the church is we have too many old people, 
and not enough patriarchs and matriarchs. There's a difference. Patriarchs and matriarchs leverage the odometer of their spiritual journey with God to joyfully invest down in succeeding generations, inspiring them for a life in Christ for a time they will not see. If you're a seasoned saint, you should be holding court at the local first watch or whatever breakfast diner with a line of people waiting to glean pearls of wisdom from you. But what will kill it is murmuring, grumbling, and complaining. We need seasoned saints who are marked by joy, who are battle-tested, but have not let the enemy steal their joy and replace it with grumbling. Oh, James says, while you're in your crock pot, as an example, verse 10, of suffering and patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who remain steadfast. You have heard of the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. Two thoughts as we round third and head for home. James says, Brian, when you find yourself going through a crisis, When you find yourself overwhelmed by more questions than you have answers, yes, uh, sit with your therapist, yes, sit with your pastor, but, but, but make sure you sit with the prophets. Why? Because the prophets are God's divine show and tell for his patience with us. There's Ezekiel. I love Ezekiel. Ezekiel and, and people like him and, and Hosea and others, they're, 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 they're sort of like posters of God's patience, which, which align kind of the, the crockpots of life. My youngest son thinks he's God's gift to basketball. Um, and if you walk into his room, from the time he was a little guy, he had all of these posters. There's Michael Jordan, train up a child in the way he should go. Um, there's LeBron James, parenting fail. There's... Kobe Bryant, there's Steph Curry. And there's been times we had a little, 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 little basketball goal set up in our backyard. There's been times I would, I would stand kind of in his room at the doorway. Sometimes he wouldn't even see me. And I'd watch him look at these posters. And you could just see the inspiration that was happening. He would then pick up the ball and go outside and work on his game. These posters inspired him towards a desired future. That's what posters do. And there's patience posters in the Bible. They're called the prophets. God says, Ezekiel, Ezekiel, um, my people are impatient with me. They keep jumping in and out of relationship with me. I, I I want you to kind of communicate visually to my people my patience with them. Here's what I want you to do, Ezekiel. Strip down naked, leave on your loincloth, lay on your left side. How long, God? 390 days, don't move. Because I don't move with my people. I'm the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm patient. I told the first service, God comes to Hosea. Hosea, my people keep his words whoring after other gods. They keep committing kind of adultery. Every time we sin, by the way, we commit spiritual adultery. We say to our spouse, God, you are not enough. I'm going to add to, supplement my relationship with you. I'm going to do that with the mistresses of this world. God says, "Um, Hosea, I, I want to use you as my divine show and tell for my patience with my people that I've got way more mercy than they have mess. Here's what I want you to do. I, I, I want you to marry a woman. Well, what's her name, God? Gomer. What does she do? She's a prostitute. Chapter 3, when she cheats on you, I want you to go get her. Be patient with her. Because if every time my people cheated on me by sinning, they wouldn't have made it out the first day. Patience. And then there's the number 23, the Michael Jordan of patience. James says, you've heard of the steadfastness of Job? Talk about patience. 
Here's a guy, he goes to a funeral holding 10 caskets, each of those caskets holding one of his kids. Parents aren't supposed to outlive their kids. Loses all of his money, covered from head to toe with boils. His wife is in his ear saying, curse God and die. And what does Job have the nerve to say while in the crock pot? I know my Redeemer lives. Job teaches us that when going through tough times, always let what you know about God trump how you feel about God. I feel discouraged, but I know he lives. I feel depressed, but I know he lives. I feel despondent, but I know he lives. When you find yourselves overwhelmed by life, you're going to have to learn to become your favorite podcast preacher and preach to your feelings the facts of who God is. He's patient. Finally, James says, you have seen the purpose of the Lord. In other words, there's a purpose for everything we go through. I, I think it's of the Lord that I'm, I'm preaching. If no one else gets a good word today, it's me. I'm preaching on crisis because that's where our family is. My wife's whole family, her whole family, her mother, her sister, her father right now, her whole family has cancer. But prior to the, prior to the cancer, you, you, some years ago, none of them were saved. Now two of them are. We're waiting on one more. There's a purpose. And I know that rubs some of us the wrong way, and I'm praying for their healing. But who cares if you go to hell physically whole? What if cancer was the setup to deal with the greater need, and that is your soul? There's a purpose to the rebellious kid. There's a purpose to the sickness. There's a purpose to the unemployment. There's a purpose to the infertility. There's a purpose. Growing up, my mother had an annoying hobby called cross-stitching. I don't know if you've ever seen somebody cross-stitch, but um, cross-stitch just involves taking a piece of cloth and weaving threads in and out. I, I call it annoying because Mama would always, I can see her now, we had a blue sofa in our little home there in College Park, Georgia, and she'd sit on that sofa and as a kid, I, I would sit at mama's feet, which means I was watching her cross-stitch from the bottom up. You ever watch somebody cross-stitch from the bottom up? All you see are dangling threads. No rhythm, no rhyme, no reason. I couldn't use this idiom in California, but I'm down south, so I can use it here. It, I, I would watch mama do this for hours, no rhythm, no rhyme, no reason. It seemed as if mama's cheese had slid off her cracker. Mama would do this for hours. One day, I couldn't take it. Kid, seven, eight. Mama, I don't get it. You do it for hours. This doesn't make sense. All I see are dangling threads. There's no order here. There's no beauty here. I don't get it. And Mama just smiled and patted on the sofa next to her and invited me to sit down next to her. And now I no longer saw things from the bottom up. I saw them from the top down. And what I saw was beauty and order and rhythm and rhyme and reason and an image coming to view. And years later, it would hit me. Ain't that the problem with life? 
fundamentally, the problem with life is the problem of perspective. We only see it from the bottom up. We go through things, no rhythm, no rhyme, no reason. It seems as if God's cheese has slid off his cracker. God is inviting us today. Oh, if you could sit down next to me, you would see all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. You would see that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You would be able to say what Joseph said at the end when he's there before his brothers. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. God says, all I'm asking you to do in the meantime, in between time, trust me. Macro thumas. Be patient. I want to pray. As I'm 42 seconds over, to put a clock on a chocolate preacher is cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> it ain't like the Panthers are having a great season, so you can, <laughs> you can be patient with me. I know where I'm at. I'm in Charlotte, where we have it all together. I wonder if at this campus or any of our other campuses, if anyone's bold enough to say, I'm in a crock pot. <laughs> I'm in a situation right now I don't like, and I just need prayer. If that's you, would you stand? I, I just want to pray for you. We're not going to ask you any questions. I, I'm just in a crock pot right now. I'm in a situation I don't like across all of our campuses. I'm, I'm going to pray, but prayer is not a spectator sport. It's a team sport. So for those of you who are sitting, I want to give you freedom in this place right now as we just go into prayer. You're free to stand with someone who's standing. If you want to put an arm around him, you can do that. If you want to stretch a hand towards them, you have that freedom. All over this room, all across our campuses, we're praying right now. Father, in the name of Jesus... Think of what Paul says of the Spirit, that the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings that cannot be uttered. I don't know anything about these people. I don't. I don't know what it is they're going through. I don't know the unique struggles, stresses, strains that have come across their doorsteps. But I don't need to know. I call on one who does. And so I just pray this. David in Psalm 8. <laughs> he says, what is man that you are mindful of him? So here's the first thing, Lord God. God, we begin with this truth. That this situation I'm in that I don't like you're mindful of. You know it. You see me. That, that, that what I'm going through is no surprise to you. You know. You see. In fact, that's exactly what you said to Moses in the burning bush. Moses, I have seen. I have heard. You know about it. Not only that, David goes on to say, what is man that you are mindful of him? And I love this part. This is what blesses me. Or the son of man that you care for him. <laughs> so God, here's the truth. You, you know and you care. So we rebuke the enemy today. 
who would whisper in our ears and would say, God doesn't care. That's a lie. God cares. Would you speak those two words over yourself out loud right now? Would you just say them to yourself? God cares. Just one more time. God cares. God, you care about the wayward child. God, you care about the health crisis. God, you care about the financial difficulty. God, you care about the broken marriage. God, you care. So here's what I'm going to pray. Jesus, I'm, I'm quoting you. I'm not quoting a health and wealth prosperity preacher. I'm quoting our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I'm taking you and I'm taking your words and I'm putting them right back at you. This is what you said to us. Matthew 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So I'm just going to take that and here's my prayer. God, cure the cancer. God, heal the physical ailment. God, bring back the wayward child. God, pump in fresh life into that marriage. God, rid the suicidal thoughts, the mental health challenges. God, give the job. God, restore the credit. God, fix it, we pray in the name of Jesus. But in the meantime, in between time, as we wait, give us the strength to be patient. Amen.